That brings us to the mayor's report. Uh, so the main topic I wanted to talk about this evening is uh, this agreement that you probably have seen <clears throat> in the press. It was uh, published, I believe, in The Spy, on The Guardian, and the Kent County News. Uh, the document was signed by me on June 22nd, 2016, and really marked the culmination of a couple of years of talks uh, with both the MDE and the hospital. Um, before I get into the actual agreement, I want to state, and th I think this is really important to note, that as of right now, our wells have not been contaminated by the spill at the hospital. There's been a system in place called a pump and treat system, which basically is pumping the groundwater towards a central location on the campus of the hospital, and in so doing, they've been recovering any free heating oil that leaked into the ground, and also has been preventing any oil from leaving this zone of hydraulic control, and I don't want to start getting too technical, but it's kind of a technical issue. Um, so for the past 30 or so years, we've been pretty comfortable that this pump and treat system has been containing whatever's left in the ground, and the amount left in the ground is very debatable. Um, but in reading the tea leaves, it seems pretty apparent that the hospital and MDB are moving towards a different mode of treating the spill, which ever since I've been elected has been a cause of concern to our utilities manager, our town manager, and the mayor and council. So I want to I want to start by saying that right now our wells are not contaminated. So the agreement that we signed with the hospital really is is what I consider a preemptive agreement on what would happen if. Uh, this new plan of remediation using a product called Ivysol were to lead to a worst case scenario. What steps would be taken if the contaminants migrated out of the zone of control of the pumps? What happens if and when the pumps are allowed to be turned off by MDE? If there's contaminants that move, how do we detect them? Where do they, we detect them? And if they do escape and, and contaminate our wells, who is going to stand up for the town and cover us financially. So I think it's really important, talking about this agreement, to look at the historical context of this spill starting in 1987. So with all of this being said, for 30 years the town has never really had a meaningful seat at the table with either one of these entities, with MDE or the hospital. We basically, for lack of a better term, been kind of relegated to the role of the red-headed stepchild that's yelling and screaming on the sidelines trying to get people to pay attention to our concerns relative to our drinking water. And for that reason, for this year, um, we made overtures, seeing that MDE was not going to engineer a three-way consent order, we began making overtures to the hospital, basically saying, would you all, as the responsible party, be willing to indemnify us? If you're so confident that Ivy Sol is the way to go, then just give us assurances that if it all goes wrong, you will sign an indemnification agreement that hopefully will never have to, to use. Uh, and they agreed. And so discussions began this year. I know that many of you are aware most of our discussions at the council have happened in executive session. When we're negotiating a legal document between our council and another institution's council, it just doesn't work if we're sitting here with our council and their council and every Tom, Dick, and Harry from the public chiming in you know, their two cents. It just, it's just unrealistic. And I know that's frustrating if you're a member of the press. Um, so, on June 20th, we basically agreed in an executive session, in principle, to an agreement that we had gone over time and time again. We really never took a formal vote, but we did, I did ask for a consensus. I had everybody say what they thought about the agreement. And by a four to one majority, the council essentially endorsed me signing the consent order with the hospital, assuming that the hospital, that we could work out legal terms about what official name the hospital would sign. And uh, we also wanted the University of Maryland Medical System to sign as sort of the parent company of Shore Regional Health, just to make sure we had the proper representation on the document. I'm going to read two parts of this agreement. There's a lot of technical science stuff in this agreement that, frankly, it's for geeks and lab kids to argue about. It's way over my pay grade. Um, but all I really wanted from the very beginning was somebody to put down on paper, we've got your back if, you, if this all goes wrong. And so uh, item 5A of this agreement, uh, 
uh, it's titled Indemnification. 5A reads, the detection of any contaminants of concern above the trigger levels in an active town production well used as a drinking water source and proximately caused by the oil spill or the remediation shall trigger the hospital's obligation to indemnify and hold harmless the town for all costs of remedial actions necessary to ensure the production and delivery of safe drinking water by the town to residents and businesses without interruption. This may require the relocation or replacement of the impacted well or the addition or additional treatment depending on the nature and extent of the, extent of the contaminants. If the parties are unable to agree whether the contaminants originate from the, originate from the oil spill or remediation, then the parties in good faith shall agree to attempt to resolve the issue through non-binding arbitration using a neutral arbitrator. Each party reserves the right to seek a declaratory judgment or injunctive relief to establish the origination of the contaminants. If that's all this agreement said, I would have signed it on the very first day. But, putting yourself in the shoes of the hospital, they don't want to sign an agreement potentially uh, tying them to a multi-million dollar payment to the town if contaminants in our wells aren't proven to be from their spill. So then that leads us to 5B. There was a lot of hand wringing over these two sentences. And this is what Bob Seitz was referring to during the Utilities Commission meeting. In the event that any contaminant of concern is detected above the trigger levels in a town production well but has not been detected above the trigger levels in any sentinel monitoring well, that shall establish a rebuttable presumption that the contaminants in the production well did not originate from the oil spill or the remediation. So to explain, in the most basic terms that I can, there's a big plume of oil that we hope will never move and that MDE is going to do a great job of cleaning up in conjunction with the hospital. Our wells are down here. And the, in, in theory, the oil should travel in this direction. There was a line of four sentinel wells that, in theory, if this plume moves in a significant way towards our wells, that one of those four sentinel wells should show some contaminants on its way to our wells. In looking at the four sentinel wells, which is all that was required in the MDE agreement, we had some issues. Uh, one was that two of those wells were over 100 feet apart. So we went to the hospital. Initially, we were like, will you just strike 5B because we don't like it. And they said, no, we won't because we need some mechanism to show that this came from us. We said, okay, well, we have concerns about how far the wells are apart. So could you add more wells? Could you add three more wells and close those gaps? And they agreed to do that at their expense. Um, and so once we had seven wells, and basically a Magano line, if you will, between the plume and our wells, I personally felt comfortable that we can go, we can play the what if game to Kingdom Come and say, what if a little tiny plume goes between the wells? Yes, that's theoretically possible, but using common sense, I think it's much more likely that at some point, if and only if we get to a disastrous scenario where this giant plume is migrating downhill, one of those seven wells will probably trigger and 5B will become relevant <coughs> the minute that happens. So, with that in mind, knowing that maybe it's not the most perfect agreement you could ever get, uh, we've, on, by a four to one margin, with Linda being the abstaining vote, uh, agreed to sign the agreement, and the agreement has been signed. So, um, I want to say two things. One is that the indemnification to me is critical, but I think the other important thing, and this is, I think, underrated, for the first time in 30 years, we now have, at least with one of the two entities involved with this bill, a <coughs> binding agreement that gives us a legitimate seat at the table. We now can have a real conversation with the hospital where it's not just us yelling and screaming, but we can say, look, here's the agreement that we both signed, here's what we agreed to. And that, to me, fundamentally alters the dialogue that we can now have with the hospital especially. Um, and I know there's a lot of conspiracy theorists out there, but at some point, somebody from the town needs to stand up and be the bigger person in the room and bargain in good faith with these people, whether it's dealing with the spill or dealing with the services that we're trying to safeguard. We need these guys, and we need to have a professional working relationship where we start to rebuild that trust. And I'm hoping that this is the first step in that process. Bob and others felt maybe we'd be better off with no agreement, I would say, look at this timeline and tell me how that is logical. When we had no agreement in 1991, we lost a well, we've never gotten a penny, I don't foresee us ever getting a penny, and to me, this was the step that needed to be taken. 
So that's my summary. And we were advised by council. Uh, we were advised by two councils to, to consider the option of adopting and ratifying this publicly at this point. You may or you may not do that. It doesn't. Uh, it's a recommendation. It's something that they feel uh, doesn't hurt. So it's the legal advice of council that the town, uh, that the council now publicly ratify and affirm the final negotiated version of the, the agreement as executed by the mayor on June 22nd, 2016. I would like. To, I would like to do that. That way we can say, you know. That I don't think you could have discussed this publicly before, but now you can say, yes, that was our act. So do we need a motion? Yeah, if someone, can make, if someone wants to make a motion, you can move that, that you publicly ratify and affirm the final negotiated. The last meeting, when you held the last meeting, there were still elements to be put in. There were still requirements that you made conditions. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll move that we uh, ratify the agreement. I think it's important for people to understand that this is a negotiated agreement. You're never going to get someone to come in and just roll over and sign a blank piece of paper. We had lawyers on both sides negotiate that. So this is the best thing we could get. And, and, I, and it does, as the mayor said, uh, ties us directly to the hospital. So it, it's a start. It certainly, uh, if we ever do have contamination, it will save us a lot of money and just lawyer fees, let alone pumping and getting a new well or whatever it may be. So I, I think it's, a, uh, it's the best we can do. Um, and I disagree with the fact that, that we'd be better off with none at all. That we had none at all for 20 years and nobody even notified us. Now they're going to feel a little bit more compelled to let us know what's going on. All right, so you have a motion on the floor, is that correct? I'd like to second. Okay, okay. all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Just to bring it to the public. Yes. Yeah. Aye. Well, you're affirming and ratifying that. I'm that, not. That, that's what they're, you're ratifying the document that was signed. So if your vote was against it before, I'd just say that you. I'm still against signing that, okay. but I'm. We're bringing oh. it to the public. Oh, no, that's fine. There's well, it's public document. Okay, did we do what we were supposed to do? Yeah, that's what right. they said. You just do the same. So okay. at this point, I'm sure you guys have some questions. Um, I will say there was a public information uh, act request, and one of the things that they asked for was how much money have you guys spent on this? It's in the last four years we have spent forty thousand dollars trying to get to this point. About half of which is this calendar year as our talks accelerated. We're also in Annapolis with our council. And I'll, I'm going to tell you guys, that is not the way that I want to be spending taxpayer dollars uh, at all. And so if you're pissed about that, you're right there with me because this has been, in, there's nothing fun or motivational or inspirational about working on this. This is scary stuff. This is a serious issue. I do want to actually commend the hospital for stepping up to the plate and agreeing to talk to us. They did. They had no legal. They had no legal uh, obligation to do that. They could have said, "We're doing whatever MDE tells us to do, and we don't need to listen to you." And uh, I really commend Ken Kazell and his team. You know, uh, people have asked, what, "What's in this for the hospital?" I honestly believe that they've had so much negative PR in so many different areas that they really want to try to reach out and rebuild that trust. I and mean, I know there may be some cynical views about that, but at some point, we need to break that cycle and, and start a new dialogue that's one of uh, allegiance rather than you know, toxic uh, you know, opposition to one another. I, I'd just like to expand on that one, but I think the hospital could have just said, no, we don't want to craft an agreement with you. If necessary, we'll see you in court. And believe me, about a court case on um, a potential contamination of our wells would have cost us a lot more than $40,000 with absolutely no guarantee of the outcome.